Welcome to The Digital Difference with Scott Gulliver and Oliver Moradi. Hi everyone, welcome to episode six now of The Digital Difference podcast. I'm Scott Gulliver and you're here with uh, Ollie Moradi as well. How are you doing, Ollie? Yeah, not too bad, Scott. How are you? All right, yeah, we're um, a bit thrown out a bit today. We're doing this midweek, which isn't our normal normal operation. Um, so it's, it's kind of thrown me a little bit. I don't know about you. Um, yeah, it's definitely thrown me out today. Um, so you might see me wandering off a couple of times during the conversation, but I'll, I'll try and keep to the point. <laughs> That's something to keep an eye out for. Cool. Um, yeah, today I wanted to talk about accessibility, um, one of my favorite subjects. And I think it's something that gets overlooked a lot. So I figured we'd talk about accessibility and accessibility in everything as a topic. So um, this is a, a topic that's close to, to my heart. I think even in 2020, accessibility continues to be a bit of an afterthought for a lot of companies. And so what I wanted to look at was how we can turn accessibility into becoming at the forefront of product and, and service design and how that can have some benefits as well. So I guess we can probably start with why accessibility is so important these days. I think first and foremost, there's a bit of a, um, a misunderstanding around accessibility at times. Um, I think a lot of companies can quite often see accessibility as a small percentage of the market that, that needs to be catered for in a different way than, than the norm. But actually, it's pretty relevant to everyone. And I think as our busy lives continue to get busier and, and more strange, I think that actually having an accessible service or product right at the core of what you do um, just becomes relevant to everyone. So uh, as we'll explore, accessibility isn't just about making things, for example, um, able to be read by a screen reader so that people with vision difficulties can, uh, can understand your content. It's actually more about just reducing friction and frustration from the heart of it. And obviously that brings a lot of benefits to, to all of your audience, ultimately. Another reason why it's so important is that actually, although it's being, yeah, although it's not being given um, a lot of the attention that it does deserve these days, there are companies that are, are looking at accessibility and building into what they do really well. Ultimately, we're, we're seeing that actually those companies are the ones that are having the biggest audiences and are probably some of your biggest competitions. So there's a good benefit just from being where your competition are and hopefully in some cases passing them. Another good reason, of course, is that by opening up, even if we are just looking at that small percentage of the um, audience that, that needs to be catered for in a special way, we're opening up our audience to, to bigger numbers um, and hopefully providing our service to a wider audience that way. Absolutely, Scott, because I think it's so important that you provide for all types of people within the society at the moment. Um, and I think it actually comes down to just being fair in the end of it. Um, you know, you have all different types of audience, all different types of people with different disabilities, um, you know, with different view on things, you know, who learn differently, who access things, who access things differently. Um, so I think it's just actually about being fair to everybody and giving everybody that opportunity to use the content and use what you have. And then, you know, what you are presenting, what you are offering in the end of the day, it does then enable more and more people to use that product that you're creating or whatever, whatever content you're creating, because it does allow that accessibility and, you know, you do boost your numbers. So it's a win-win for everyone. And being fair as well, it's not just the right thing to do and it's not just a good PR angle, but actually in a lot of countries now, it's actually the law to be able to do that as well. Um, we're seeing more and more that it's being classified as discrimination not to provide an accessible service to all of your users. Domino's is a great example of this. Um, it was a pretty public thing for them where they, uh, they got sued because their site wasn't accessible to someone with visual difficulties. Um, and that's been back and forth. And obviously, we're starting to see um, exactly how that case is going to play. But it's pretty important to be fair um, across the board to all of your audience, um, whether accessibility is, is part of that or not. So yeah, this is a great way to do it. So if we have a look first of all at the the side that we know best, and I think actually accessibility probably first comes up in, in an organization, is the, the software and the digital side of a company. The tools are there now to make it really easy to make your, your software and digital products accessible. So the web is really where, where this starts. Um, web accessibility has been around for a long time. And it's something, again, that's, that's still not being really done right in a lot of cases. 
quite often it's because companies are going against the grain of the web um, and not just using the kind of bare bones that it comes with. Um, and a lot of that comes up from some of the innovative ideas that they have, but a lot of those ideas, they can be implemented in a way that still, um, still has great accessibility kind of built at the core of it. And as I said, the tools are really available now to make this super easy. So a great place to start for this in terms of just measuring where you're at or, or measuring um, how, how much of an improvement you've made on the accessibility scale is the Google Lighthouse audit tool. So this is a really simple one click and you can point at any website that's out there now um, that will spend a, a minute just, just kind of auditing your site and give you not only the accessibility score and some key areas of where you can improve, but also stats like performance and how, uh, how well it performs on mobile, how well it performs as a progressive web app, all those sort of good things um, in terms of it's uh, it's ease of use and how how performant or how good it feels to to actually use your site. So that's a great place to start, just in terms of a really quick tool you can can use right now. And Scott, do you think that these tools that say like for instance Google Lighthouse that are being created, do you think it makes it easier now for developers or people creating anybody who creates digital content to actually make their their content and whatever they're creating accessible. So do you think that there's you know there's not really much of an excuse now not to be um, not to have your content accessible? Yeah, absolutely. I think even wider than that though. I mean, the tools are certainly there to make development of these um, the, the products easy in terms of um, being accessible now. But I think what's been missing for a while is the the project managers and the people that are owning some of the, the the time and development on these platforms. Having a good awareness at that level will really pay dividends um, in terms of making sure that you're not just building what features you want um, in an accessible way, but you're thinking about it first and foremost and, and really building it in from the start. Mm. We're already seeing a lot of this um, in software teams now where we've got a lot of design and UX involved at the start. Really, those those teams are are doing really well from the start of, of factoring in things like how a user is going to actually use the platform um, and factoring in accessibility into that. That's a great way to go if you've got the resource. But even if not, just having an awareness at all levels of of some basic accessibility thoughts and keeping it again at like the forefront of of what you're doing will just make sure that you factor it in at all stages. Absolutely. And the the standards again. I mean, in terms of where where we're going to measure this against, um, there are lots of good standards out there at the moment. In terms of the web, we've got things like the um, the WCAG guidelines, which are a set of guidelines we've put together to really detail at quite a, quite a detailed level um, what you need to do to be accessible to all all types of users and what you should be factoring in it's quite a long checklist when you see these first of all but actually it's daunting to factor that into an older product but if you go with a mindset from the beginning with accessibility um, right at the heart of what you're doing then these become a much easier thing to implement but even if not with all existing products it's about measuring and improving what you've got so um, you know there's the old saying if you can't measure it you can't improve it so using tools like google lighthouse and other tools out there you can take a good idea of what you've where you actually are on that scale um, and make small improvements over time and any any improvements are going to ultimately increase the user perception of it so then we've obviously talked a little bit about the audience for accessibility um, and not just not just including those that have some of the more obvious need for accessibility requirements but there's a bunch of other people um, if you think Holly about how we use technology these days a lot of websites for example that we're using are often in noisy crowded environments um, perhaps on a mobile perhaps when you're a new parent and you're, you've got a baby in one hand and you've just got one hand to, to use the device factoring on all of that into accessibility as well will make the the friction or reduce the friction of your service um, and make it much easier for everyone to use including those who have some disabilities broadly there are kind of uh, quite a few groups of um, accessibility guidelines um, the more obvious ones are things like visuals um, and ease of interpretation so when you're looking at things like color fonts layout making sure that contrast is, is there to be able to easily read and understand the content. But more than that as well, the things like fonts and typography are a big thing in the UX side these days. And again, they're quite easy for, for any product team really to start factoring into what they're doing. Definitely. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've got onto a site or been using a piece of digital content and you've noticed that the contrast between the font and the background is really low. Um, so there's no, it's really difficult to actually read it, even for someone with good eyesight. I mean, I like to think that I have fairly good eyesight and I struggle with quite a lot of it. And you just think that obviously, or well, you can just tell that some of the, that some of the content that you see just hasn't been tested uh, properly, or you know, there's no sort of accessibility testing behind it. 
mm-hmm. um, but I've seen it. You see it more often now um, than you don't, which is quite worrying with a lot of content. I find. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think this is what I. Uh, it's not so much on web, but especially with things like web apps or. I mean, in my world, digital learning and things like that. I mean, there's a lot of uh, content that goes out that doesn't really um, adhere to sort of the uh, accessibility guidelines. And I think that it's it's something that people should really look into a bit, a bit more, especially with the color and the font. I think design has kind of brought us around to that in, in, a, in a large sense. Modern design tends to be quite soft, quite low contrast, um, quite subtle colors and, and fonts and things. And obviously all of those don't do much favor for the, the accessibility of it. I think, again, it's about factoring in accessibility right at that design stage even. These days, there are a bunch of tools you can plug into design frameworks and tools that will just help you create accessible content from the start, things like contrast checkers um, and other bits like that. So the tools are there. It's just I think people don't necessarily have the have it at the forefront of their minds to factor in at all stages. No, and I think I think it's one of those things that people don't even really consider Yeah. Um, when they're designing. Yeah. You know, some will some will, will make something look really nice, and as a designer, especially, you're going in there to make something look good and pop and look great. But you don't really think about the accessibility side of things, and I think that that's sort of a mind space that people need to start getting into. Um, you know, have that sort of mind frame of when they come to design um, any bit of content. You know, is this accessible? Because ultimately, it's it's your content's going out there to attract people to use it. Mm-hmm. And if people can't use it, what's the point in having it? The other group of um, accessibility guidelines is is about um, ease of understanding as well. So beyond just the presentation of um, of what you've got, you can think about things like the structure of the content itself and, and how readable the actual content is. A good example of this will be with people that are dyslexic. And gen- even generally more than that, we're, we're finding that audiences these days are, are scanning content far more than they're actually going in depth with content. So having content that, again, appeals probably to dyslexic audiences or um, a similar kind of audience, first of all, will make it more appealable to everyone, really. And then even beyond that, beyond written content, you can think about other formats that might be suitable for people. So in the web, what we've traditionally done is layer some standards over our content that's written down so that it's accessible to screen readers. Um, With a lot of content marketing these days, you can actually find that you can probably make use of the same content, but make it available in different formats. So it may be, it may be video for someone who um, who finds it hard to to read or just isn't in an environment where they can read something. Um, It may be an audio, maybe releasing it through some sort of podcast or something like that. Um, There are a bunch of options these days and the tech is, is out there for people to be able to essentially send their content out in multiple formats and have it um, readily accessible for whatever means people want to consume it by. Well, on and I, and I and I think that like like you said here, it's all about tech and the progression of tech over the last I don't know, 15, 20 years has made it really easy for anybody to be able to access content or and and create content that's accessible for everybody. Yeah. So do like again, I go back to that point. I mean, is it acceptable to not be accessible? I think everyone would agree that it's probably not, but um, it rarely happens. So <laughs> something's missing. Yeah. And then the kind of the last camp of um, of accessibility standards or things to think about, and we're missing a bunch here, but the, the other kind of big one is thinking about your controls and your input, especially with things like apps and web apps um, and other kind of services along those lines. So this kind of originally came from things like people who had maybe limited dexterity or um, an inability to actually use things like a, a keyboard and mouse that most things were designed for. But again, in terms of of how applicable this is to a wider audience now, you've got everyone using mobile by default. Um, we don't have things like a mouse to hover over. We don't have that fine control over pointers. So making your controls and inputs really um, accessible to all and really easy to use um, will pay dividends to to all of the audience, really. And there are a bunch of standards that we can look to, um, not only just the the uh, WCAG standards and, and others like that. Um, there are a good amount of guidelines online. Um, Apple iOS um, guidelines, that the accessibility guidelines that they have are, are really, really good and readable. Um, and similarly, the Android developer guidelines. Um, there are a bunch of these around um, created by some really big companies like Apple and Google that are just really good, um, really good reads and, and will go a long way to helping um, pretty much anyone that's developing products or services in the digital world uh, to start thinking about how they might adapt their own products for a wider audience. 
So Scott, if you th if you are a developer creating an app or anything like that, do you think that using these guidelines created, say, by Google or Apple, are probably the best way to go forward? Because your app will be hosted on either Google Play or um, the App Store or the Apple Store in the end of it. Yeah, totally. They're really they're really well written guides, especially the the Apple and the Android ones. Um, in terms of they are pretty specific, but equally they introduce a lot of good concepts that are applicable anywhere. Obviously, companies like Apple do a really good process of actually strictly checking um, apps when they come through onto the store before they get through they'll be checked for things like accessibility but they're not going to go as far as maybe um, some people think that you should in terms of of how accessible something is so of course reading those guidelines if you're building an app on those platforms is crucial i would say um, but even if you're not and if you even if you're creating something that's maybe slightly out of the norm um, it's definitely worth using these guidelines or at least giving them a glance um, just to get some good ideas from that, that will be useful anywhere and then, of course, the last thing to think about in terms of software and digital is to is to test this stuff. Once you've got a good understanding of what accessibility means and you're starting to think about how to introduce that, the best way, really, and factoring in agile development as well um, to, to help to shape and build the platform with, with that in mind, is to test ideally with real users in real environments. And real environments is pretty key, even if you're not going to get a, a huge audience that might have some of the disabilities you want to factor in. Just getting your new website, for example, or new web app used out in the real world, out in a busy environment, um, maybe using it one-handed. Factoring those things in the test environment will, will just make sure that when it goes up to real users, you aren't getting um, instant feedback that things aren't working. Yeah, definitely. And I also think that it's quite important to get on board with, say, the user before you even start designing. Yeah, absolutely. Just to kind of get that feedback, you know, maybe send out a few focus groups, get the ideas back and ask some key questions around accessibility to the few focus groups as well. Just to kind of get an overall feel of what you think that, or what they think, sorry, would be best to incorporate into your digital content, whatever you're planning to build. And I think that, you know, if you do that, then when it does come to that testing phase, you're not going to be tripped over by so many different accessibility issues you know, that you're going to have to go back to square one and start rebuilding, you, you know, you can then just kind of, kind of just make a few tweaks. Whereas, I mean, I know that I've created content before and then it's gone off to testing and there have been a few issues that maybe I haven't seen that I haven't been prepared for. And, you know, I've had to go back and make some major changes to the structure and the build of, of my content. So, I mean, I think it's really important to just get on board and have that kind of that initial consultation or discussion with your focus groups to kind of figure out the best um, options for accessibility. And actually, there are a bunch of external companies that can help with this, really um, specialised in that testing environment. But I think what you've done has actually brought me pretty nicely onto my next section, um, which is about really whether you should provide alternatives to kind of your core experience or whether it should be explicitly designed with accessibility in mind. Because um, you're right, I, I think if you're going to be testing at a later stage to make sure that the thing you've designed is accessible what you'll probably end up doing is what most of us do at the moment which is to go and retrofit some accessibility options into into the core product we don't need to to go into a full development phase um, which is often quite expensive and, and you can often feel quite cornered in at that point to actually deliver the product using some of the the tools we have these days to prototype um, really quickly in a couple of days we can get something up once we've had a, a chat with the real users about about some of their needs and how they actually might end up using this thing in the real world we can then take that good advice and, and build some prototype and just get it get it into the hands of them early get some feedback on that before we even touch development the thing that development will will hopefully prove out is is some of the technology that's involved in terms of screen readers and other things but actually the prototypes will be a great option to to completely rethink how you might uh, approach something with accessibility mode from the start. And this is where, if you practice design thinking, this is a perfect opportunity where you can set accessibility within that as well. Um, you know, just having the yep. prototypes that you're continuously creating. Um, and, you know, if it doesn't work, then you haven't done too much work and you take it back to the drawing board and come up with another prototype. You know, it, it's all about just not taking that product too far and then realizing that it's not accessible and having to take it back to the drawing board at a late stage within your project. Yeah, I think the thing with design thinking as well is that it's it's used quite, we're seeing it used more and more as a tool right at the start of a project, but actually if you've got an existing project um, and maybe accessibility hasn't been considered before, um, it's a great way to jump in and, and maybe rethink how you might approach something. That doesn't need to be a complete rewrite all the, all the time. It can be a small feature 
and just rethinking how you might approach that. It might be slightly more work to go and, and do that rather than uh, just implement it on the framework that you've already got it in. Um, but just rethinking that with some design thinking and taking almost a, a step back from what you're currently doing could be really useful. Definitely. I think we, we are getting closer and closer to the, the explicitly designed uh, products and services rather than providing alternatives. We used to see um, on the web all the time the example of a high contrast button, for example. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to your design example where a lot of designs these days are pretty muted and have low contrast, but actually rather than providing a high contrast button for those percentage of users that manage to have a look there and, and, and actually look for it, it's much better just to improve your design from the start, um, especially for those companies that are more marketing based and, and using um, their brand design, for example, um, for marketing purposes. A lot of people won't end up looking for those sort of buttons to improve their experience. They'll just be turned off immediately and look elsewhere. Absolutely. It's expected now, really. Yeah, for sure. And there's just too much choice as well. Um, there's no reason for people to, to hunt for options and settings and, and dials to, to move in your product. They'll just look elsewhere. There's, there's lots of choice these days. Yeah, definitely. And it's quite interesting that you say that as well, because I know personally, if I go onto a website and straight away, I don't feel like it's a good fit for me in terms of usability, for instance, accessibility. I will just switch off and go somewhere else. And I'll go to somewhere where I find that it's easy to use um, and it is accessible. So we put it on as a back thought, really, a lot of the time when we used to design. But I think now it's, it's more important than ever to kind of keep people on your side is to have good accessibility. Yeah. And I know we talk about it a lot, but, um, you know, agile is great here in terms of actually measuring um, your engagement and conversion, just changing little things like designs and AB testing, that sort of stuff is a great way to actually move beyond the theory of, of what we think might work for people and, um, and actually see what will work for people by looking at the results. Just coming back to the high contrast example, um, again, as well, as you're thinking about it, I think there is a balance to strike between giving people options that they can use and, and introducing too many compromises. So companies now are, are going more and more into the, the realm of providing options for people to customize their experience, um, whether that's just in the latest kind of dark mode um, that's been introduced on a lot of phones. So you see these days, a lot of websites react to that and will, um, will change the experience based on your settings. A classic kind of example of this is the Apple versus Google approach, where Google tend to give people lots of um, options and um, settings that they can tweak for their services, whereas Apple will tend to go for the approach that they really know what's best for the user. And by taking away options, you, you reduce compromises um, and you provide the best experience generally for everyone. Of course, there's a balance to strike in the middle there, but thinking about your audience that might benefit from some accessible uh, features or accessibility features, um, it might be worth considering switching some of them on by default or even just having them as the only option within the platform to improve the experience for everybody. If, of course, if that doesn't end up um, damaging the overall experience too much, hopefully it should improve the experience. And that's really what we're aiming for here. Definitely. And then, you know, sometimes trade-offs do need to be made when, when we've got a service that works really well, um, but ultimately there's just one piece of it that isn't, isn't accessible. Um, and we need to maybe make an alternative version that isn't quite what we what we really had hoped we would get out. I think that's fine. Um, and ultimately, the technology is getting easier and easier to implement the, the first approach. But sometimes there's just no way around it. But I think it's just about making informed decisions of that, about those. And more often than not, these days, people just aren't really making those decisions in an informed way. OK, Scott, so where do you think this factors um, into the company experience as a whole? That's a great question. Um, as I said right at the start, I think actually um, the digital and software side of things are are in a pretty good place these days. People aren't necessarily making use of um, the opportunities that are available for them, but the technology is certainly there and the tools are there for them to be able to, to work that stuff out. I think if you were to factor in the company experience as a whole, that's, that's again, another level of opportunity here. We've already talked about the marketing um, side of things where if you land on a website that's designed as a primary marketing tool, um, if that's not accessible, then you're going to be turning off a whole bunch of users by default. For, for, for some users, that, that brand experience can be severely compromised um, if you haven't thought about accessibility from the start. By brand, I, I don't just mean um, you know, the, the typography and colors being uh, in the right contrast, but it's, it's everything. It's about how we're talking to customers, how we're, uh, how we're reaching our customers, and of course, factoring in all of our customers in, in an equal way and considering those that might need um, a little bit more thought in terms of the accessibility department um, can be a really good way of actually um, having a brand that's engaging for everyone. 
so do you think that it can affect the level of professionalism that you portray for instance if you have a website that you've created and, and it doesn't and it's not very accessible yeah totally beyond just accessibility as well i mean accessibility is a big part of what we're talking about here but just not forgetting the basics is an, is really an important step in appearing like a like a reputable place where people are likely to spend their money beyond just appearing professional you know that's ultimately what what companies are in business for um is to, to get people to part with their cash so Unfortunately, a lot of websites that companies um, produce still neglect to address things like being mobile friendly, being accessible to all, um, being easy to understand um, and being easy to find. As we've talked about, all of those factor into accessibility for, for everyone involved. Beyond that, ensuring the site is, is uh, secure and performant as well, which certainly do go some way to impact the accessibility of it. But for sure, if those basics are forgotten, which again, they often are, um, that can certainly impact the professionalism that a company um, seems to have and ultimately will stop people spending the money there. And then the other thing as well is that when we consider the brand and the company, um, we're seeing this shift now where companies are having to be more people first or more um, customer first. And this really concerns almost all touch points. So thinking about accessibility right from the start in terms of not only um, how our digital products and services act and, and look and feel, but also think about the physical stores that people go into day to day, uh, making sure they're, they're literally physically accessible, but also um, easy to, to navigate within, um, easy to, to just make use of as well, that there's, there's plenty of options for people to um, get the same service regardless of how they want to interact with it. Right down to things like marketing materials, making sure that those are, um, again, available for all and, and certainly unbiased in, in the best way we can make them. And then right down to even correspondence. So this actually has been an area that's been done pretty well in the past um, through kind of snail mail and, and literally uh, letters in the post. Um, that's been done pretty well in the past where there's alternatives available, whether it's um, through Braille or through um, audio options that might be made available. What that hasn't done is really translate well into things like email that come through. Um, but again, it's, it's really thinking about the whole um, kind of holistic um, view of it really and making sure that we're we're just considering accessibility from the start. So you're just kind of basically saying just be consistent with your accessibility across all different channels of your business. Yeah, totally. And that's not an easy thing to achieve for sure. Um, and some would even say that actually it's, it's almost a thing that needs to be embedded in the culture. But again, you can make small improvements towards that way. Um, it's just being, about, it's, it's being mindful of it and understanding it and making small adjustments towards that if if that's going to be um the best thing for your business to do and i think hopefully we've explored here that usually will be innovation doesn't necessarily need to go against the um the grain of accessibility um, we see this in the web a lot where um the most accessible sites are the ones that are pushing the boundaries on the technology but actually innovation can often open up new ways to deliver the same service to all users in an accessible way a great example of this actually is with um with the ai that we're seeing these days so a lot more things are being AI driven rather than uh, leaning on user input, things like providing just in time uh, alerts and notifications um, and information right where we need it can actually help um, a lot of people to get information when they need it in a busy environment or when they don't have the capacity or the um, ability to really input the data they need to. So we've talked about it in previous episodes, but having some sort of department or team focused on innovation can really play a big part in helping your company move the needle on how accessible you are. It's actually also about being innovative about accessibility itself. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a bunch of opportunity there. And certainly what we've got today um, won't look like what we've got in 10 years time. Um, so as a company, you can really help yourself stand out by just leaning on that and actually make yourselves a much easier place for people to uh, to use without the friction being there definitely and as you've said before I mean, as we covered off earlier um different software and tech that's constantly being produced and you know evolution within that space will also give you new options to become more accessible in different ways yeah i think we've covered the majority of it i mean hopefully that's opened up the door to a few more companies to start thinking about accessibility from the start Obviously, it's much easier to get this right at the start of a project, um, but equally, you can quite easily implement a lot of these tools today on existing projects and actually help them to become a little bit better in that regard. So, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Scott. That's been really, really insightful. Well, thanks, everyone, again, for listening today. Um, next episode should be out in a couple of weeks, and our website's now up uh, with the transcripts of all the shows. The past episodes are all hosted there, and you can find that at thedigitaldifference.show. Thanks again for joining us, and thanks, Ollie.
Cheers, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope you've enjoyed the episode. We wanted to let you know a little about our digital agency. We design and build killer experiences and apps, and we also put out a bunch of free content to help companies of all shapes and sizes. Head to fluffdigital.com to find out more. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to keep a lookout for the next episode real soon.